This presentation explores the changes in menswear in the first decades of the 20th century. With the onset of modernism, we will see a generation gap form in the zeitgeist, much like what we're experiencing today. The older establishment figures grew up in the Victorian era and will have difficulty changing at the same fast pace younger people do. Modern men will embrace the radical changes in society and therefore in their wardrobes. The three-piece sack suit will remain the normal attire for middle classes and Americans. Wealthy men will retain the full range of coat styles, frock, morning coat, and tailcoat, each required at very specific events, such as formal business or social events, many of which required special suits as a form of distinction. This era will see the last of older styles, such as the frock coats, for daily business, largely remaining for authority figures such as ministers, government officials, and the traditional establishment. By 1911, the boxy sack jacket from the Belle Epoque will be more fitted to the body, and we will see some young men adopt shorter jacket styles as well. These suits from a 1915 tailor's manual show the latest styles, describing them as extremely swagger or trendy. The tailoring details of suit coats remain somewhat the same from the Belle Epoque, with a few notable additions. Note the options of a high nipped waist seen on the figure at the far left. This is flattering on young men with slender form. Shorter coat styles were also an option, with the jacket falling to just below the derriere, or at about even with the knuckles of the hand, as seen on the gentleman on the right. By 1915, the effects of World War I were noted in the tailoring profession. Young men who had been to war were in good shape. Officers' uniforms featured a long cut that was very trim at the waist. Civilian wardrobes began to advertise the high-nipped waist as a desirable military trim or military fit feature. Older men who did not fight in the war or had a portly figure continued to wear the boxy shape from before, as you can see on the right. Another new styling element is the patch pocket inspired by hunting and sporting coats. Patch pockets are additional squares of fabric that sit on the outside of the suit. On the left, we can compare a Belle Epoque golfing suit with patch pockets to hold golf tees and other sundries. We would also expect to see them added to Norfolk jackets, which can be worn in the country or around town or the suburbs on the weekends. By the 19-teens, the patch pocket migrates to a regular suit to be worn for casual events, not business. This is the beginning of the lines blurring between business suits and sports suits, a long trend we will follow during the 20th century. Other innovations include the number of buttons on the front of a jacket. Jackets that close higher up on the chest require more buttons to hold it in place. On the left, we see a three-button suit, a traditional number to hold a higher lapel in place. In the center, we see two buttons, creating a longer lapel line so the suit closes lower on the chest. And on the right, we see a double-breasted suit. Double-breasted coats and suits have been available since the neoclassical era, but they come and go from fashion in cycles. They return again in force after World War I brings a new emphasis on military uniforms back to society's attention. It's worth noting the buttons line up with each other in straight lines on the torso. And after the exuberant array of lapel styles used in the 19th century, we will now develop some rules. One is that the peak lapel will only be worn with a double-breasted suit to lend a dashing or sporty effect to this style. We are about to see, however, that American tailoring manufacturers will break these rules. 
attracting no shortage of outrage or pity from Savile Row tailors. All of these styling options are considered personal choice for each man to make. The waistcoat sheds its lapels using a plain V-shape overlap in the front, although, as always, older men may keep lapel styles longer. The waistcoat is worn well over the top of the trousers with two points at the bottom. In 1915, the points elongate to emphasize the military trim waist. At the right, we can see longer points on two establishment men. The oldest gentleman wears a morning suit, now frozen fashion, to be worn to formal day events and worn with striped trousers called strollers. Trousers were worn short off the top of the foot and narrow at the hem. Young men begin wearing permanent turn-ups sewn into trousers to stay in place. Men's suits advertisements continue to show suits without turn-ups. The sharp crease is visible all the way up the front of the leg. Men still have the option of a belt or suspenders to hold up their trousers. The formal wear options from the Belle Epoque remain tuxedo and tailcoat. During World War I, the British government discourages the use of the tailcoat or white tie as too excessive in wartime. Formal functions now allow the tuxedo as a substitute, and the tailcoat will never again return to the same ubiquitous prominence it once had. The waistcoat and tie color match black with the tuxedo and white with the tailcoat. The top hat is now shorter and a little more slender, creating a more modern shape. Coat styles for men remain the same with everyday coats or ulsters made of wool or Burberry's gabardine. A new sports coat emerges in the Belle Epoque and the teens, the duster coat made of canvas or other heavy materials to protect the clothing during activities such as driving. Another new styling more widely available for men is the raglan sleeve used for outer coats. This option eliminates the seam that attaches a sleeve to the coat, which we can see at the right. This seam also serves to emphasize the shoulder line. The raglan sleeve on the left is sewn into the body of the coat, creating a shoulder strap effect from wrist to neck, bypassing the shoulder as an area of interest. This creates the illusion of a sloped shoulder. Men's shirts now fully buttoned down the front with this change slowly creeping in during the Belle Epoque on shirt styles called lingerie shirts or casual shirts. The lingerie shirt included a fold-down collar, just like our dress shirts today. This has been available as a working man's shirt since the 19th century, and this is an example of work clothing trickling upward to influence fashion as fashion begins to shed some of its social formalities. Men who wish for a particularly starched collar or who had to maintain a certain level of grooming for their profession continue to wear the separate collar. Collars are pointed or round shaped with a fairly narrow spread at the front for the tie. One hallmark of this era is the combination of a striped shirt and white collar. Men continue to wear bow ties and foreign hand ties, now called a Windsor tie, named after the Duke of Windsor, who will become King Edward VIII of England. He was widely admired during this era for his flair and would influence many trends. Ties are now tied with a narrow or wide knot named a Windsor knot or half Windsor knot, which we still use today. A new trend emerges, the scarf tie or wash tie seen on the right. Modern men rebel against the Victorian rules about limiting colors in their wardrobes, and new blue and tobacco colors are introduced. 
Advertisers take great pains to show these models in casual settings, such as the seaside, as we can see in the background. Colors such as these would be very daring in a business environment. Another important new style feature is the introduction of pinstripes to menswear fabrics. Sports team sweaters evolved to include thin jersey t-shirts, such as the one we see on the right, and the cardigan sweater with a button front closure on the left. Both of these garments will enter the civilian wardrobe quickly, especially in America, where the sheer number of high schools and colleges was growing every year, enrolling people from all over in organized sports. At the same time, in 1911, the U.S. Army introduced the service sweater to replace a wool coat in the field when the weather was too cold for a flannel shirt. It was considered to be neat and not unsoldierly in appearance. It had added advantages in allowing freedom of movement and a soldier could sleep in it if the need arose. The collar is not part of the sweater. That is an army issue flannel shirt worn in the regulation way with the collar pulled to the outside. The sweater was widely worn by officers and enlisted men through World War I and it was most notably worn along the border with Mexico in search of Pancho Villa. Knitting mills marketed sweaters to the general public who embraced them as practical and comfortable dressing. Many women knitted sweaters for soldiers and knitting yarn makers published instructions for many different styles. It's important to acknowledge this style was homegrown and promoted in mass market fashion. It did not originate with the official fashion taste makers in Paris, who would not catch up to its importance for a few years yet. This is an important step in America developing its own fashion voice using sports attire as inspiration. From the Belle Epoque to this era, men's shoe styles develop rules, just as the rest of their wardrobe did. This era shows the triumph of the low-cut Oxford-style shoe, with older men continuing to wear high-cut ankle shoes at times. The most formal business or dress shoe is called a Balmoral style. It is a smooth-fitting shoe that laces over the instep. The distinctive feature of the Balmoral is the lacing panel sewn into the body of the shoe, creating a smooth fit. This is more laborious and so more expensive. The punched hole designs are called brogue decor or broguing. This makes the shoe more sporty or casual. The other style of shoe is a blucher shoe, made at first for sports or walking. The lacing panels sit on top of the instep and they pull open more widely to accommodate a thick sock or to readjust while walking. It was not considered a proper business shoe by Europeans or the East Coast establishment. Midwestern and Western Americans would relax these rules more, as will the middle classes. Who can resist this group of men showing off their new underwear? Judging from the background, I wonder if they have reported to boot camp for the war. The Victorian Union suit breaks into two pieces for convenience. The shorter combination underwear also splits into two. This split creates the idea of an undershirt and underpants. The combination style continues for those who prefer it or for sports. The American Army issued a contract to the New York firm Bradley, Voorhees, and Day, whose label read BVD. Millions of men received the two-part underwear with their army kit, and the term BVDs became a substitute term for men's underwear in general. To conclude menswear of the Belle Epoque, let's look at two photos of U.S. President Woodrow Wilson. On the left, we see his inauguration ceremony in 1917. 
It is cold outside, so he wears a proper Chesterfield coat with the velvet collar, the most formal overcoat. We can't see what style suit he's wearing, but he is wearing a top hat, which means he wears formal day wear, either a frock coat or a morning coat. Just past him, we see other ranking officials wearing top hats. And toward the back, we see everyone else in fedora or Hamburg hats. We can see that some of them also wear a Chesterfield coat, but most likely wear a sack suit because they are not part of the actual inaugural party. In the photo on the right, we see Wilson on a different occasion wearing the morning coat for some state occasion. Notice the long points of his waistcoat. Everyone around him wears a sack suit. These photos captured the Belle Epoque era with that last vestige of formality and refined dress for men, but the modern world encroaching all around.